Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Ray Bidigan. I'm the president of the board of the Photography Council here at the museum, and I am glad you are all here. Um, we love putting on these brown bag talks. Uh, oh, somebody just turned me up a little bit. Uh, they're nicely sponsored by Pro Photo Supply. Uh, they do a wonderful job of uh, not only sponsoring the brown bag talks, but they help the museum in many other ways as well. So I encourage you all, you need some camera gear, you need some film, you need some materials, head over to Pro Photo Supply. Turn off the B&H app and shop local. Um, I am so excited today uh, to have Jim Hare uh, speaking, and I think I want to start by uh, thanking Jim in one sort of personal way, and that is every time I run into Jim, whether I'm walking into Blue Moon Camera or I see him at, uh, on the street out taking pictures because he's always doing that, uh, he has a way of making, uh, making me feel special and important, and I suspect he does that for a lot of the rest of you as well. So thank you, Jim, for that. And uh, today is our turn to make you feel special and important by uh, having a look at your work. And I understand and I suspect that you've got a lot of it to show us. So everybody, please welcome Jim Hare. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I understand I'm supposed to limit it to 30 minutes, but I've got about 30,000 photographs to show. <laughs> Uh, it will be mostly visual. I'll try to keep the stories down and skip through to the, uh, the, the good stuff. I do want to thank Dr. Dolan, who I've never met, <laughs> and for allowing me to have a photograph in the museum. It's been one of the goals uh, I've always had. Uh, and Pro Photo Supply for sponsoring this event and supporting the museum. Uh, Ray Bidigan and Heidi Kirkpatrick for the invitation. It's not their fault. I'd also like to thank uh, the people who put up with me on a daily basis. Wednesday through Saturday, I show up at Blue Moon Camera. And not only do they provide me with the tools of my addiction, but they also inspire me to do amazing things. Every, photog every person who works there is a photographer. They've all got their own priorities, their own specialties, and uh, they're covering for me today because I called in sick. Don't tell Jake. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my wife, Vicki, put up with me um, and continues to make me do a lot better. So, uh, Vicki, everything that I've done since I met her has been better. Um, Ray said, don't start with birth to death, don't do a birth to death thing. So I'm going to start before I was born. <laughs> my grandparents, well, actually my grandmother, my maternal grandmother who raised me is the little girl here on the right. Uh, she came over from Wales with her father who was a coal miner in the Rhonda Valley. Um, in 1938, his youngest son made a, a film which I just had transferred to DVD. And for the first time I saw the kind of camera that he used which was a Leica, and I wish I had that Leica now because it'd be worth about $8,000. As I grew up with my grandparents from the age of three, uh, I had Peter Pan on one wall, and on the wall above my bed, I had a photograph from Life magazine, and it was of a Chinese soldier with uh, bamboo sandals eating a bowl of rice. And it was made by my grandmother's youngest brother, Jack. Jack Wilkes was a life photographer. Uh, that's actually his role and his typewriter. He was Asia bureau chief during World War II, and he had photographs of Chairman Mao before he was Chairman Mao and General Chiang Kai-shek. And he's always been at my shoulder uh, as I worked through college. And I have the suspicion that my grandmother missing him, uh, her favorite brother who died when I was nine, inspired me to become a photographer. And uh, she gave me access to her cameras and, of course, family photos uh, or photographs of my friends at school. Uh, my best friend, John Simon, is in the middle with the flute case, which he always said was a machine gun because it was a lot cooler to carry around a machine gun at those days. And, uh, in high school, I wandered around through the streets of San Diego on a bicycle, and this was, <coughs> photograph was made at about 2 in the morning at a, a park bench uh, at the beach. I used that photograph for a flyer when I went to college, 
And someone annoyingly wrote underneath it, focus. And for about a week, I was really bummed out. I was like, oh man, focus. Well, it was a three second exposure or something. Someone else came up to me later and said, you know, they've been having nightmares for the last week and that face keeps following them. So it, it made it all better. My grandfather was on the USS Enterprise in the Pacific during World War II, uh, served and was a day's sail out of Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. He came back not only to take care of me and my grandmother, but he built a Japanese garden in the backyard, and I wish I could have asked him. Uh, avoiding death at the hands of the Japanese military for years, coming back and building uh, a garden with a Buddha and a Tory gate. Uh, when I went to college, I asked for an assignment. Uh, I was still sort of thinking in a journalistic mode, and I went to Rita Bottoms, who was head of special collections. She gave me a list of movers and shakers at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Uh, Alan Chadwick had started a garden. Uh, Angela Davis had done a couple of things. Uh, the poet William Everson. Um, Gregory Bateson, thank you. This was a test. Um, married to Margaret Mead. This photograph I had made, and in moving around, I had wrapped the roll of film up, threw it in a box, forgot about it. I actually processed this film 10 years, unfortunately, after he died. Um, I have a bias towards film. Anyway, uh, Norman O'Brown, the historian Paige Smith, and in breaks between going to, sorry, David, in breaks between college, if I had a couple of dollars, 20 bucks, I would hitchhike somewhere. Uh, I often came to Portland. My best friend John's older brother David was a Reed graduate and a Zen master, woodworker, craftsman, artist. He also had uh, all the best music, the band, before I even knew that they'd recorded with Bob Dylan. So I used to come up to visit David in Portland. And also Barbie, John's older sister, she lived on an island off British Columbia. And one of the trips we were hitchhiking and the guy that was driving we were going through Seattle, and he said, oh, there's a crowd of hippies over there. Let's go see what's going on. And they were having a soapbox derby down Pike Place. <laughs> and I walked down the alley, and he stepped in front of me as I took a picture of this couple embracing. And I just sort of paused. He kept walking. I turned, and I made another photograph, and I guess I had made some noise, and the woman looked at me. The first photograph, unfortunately, you know, she was blocked, but the second one, she was looking at me, and I thought, this might be great. Um, when he came back, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, there's this couple, and I turned, and they were gone. And it was kind of like, were they really there? I'd gone up to the island, two weeks later, came back to Santa Cruz, processed the film, hoped that I had an image, and it was one of my favorites. Uh, made with uh, an old Yashica camera, the cheap lens, vignetted, uh, everything about it. I love the image, even though it wasn't made with uh, a Hasselblad. The gum wall now, actually, okay, so that's before, in 1973, that's the gum wall last month. So, and they've cleaned it off, but I heard from a group of uh, rappers that came into Blue Moon to pick up some stuff that, uh, oh, it's back, don't worry about it. They, they back. Also, traveling back to San Diego, I would visit my grandparents and uh, needing food. All my money went to film and, and chemistry. Uh, so this is what my grandparents had to put up with. Uh, Bob and Ellie became my surrogate parents, and kind of like Eddie Haskell in Leave it to Beaver, I would just wander in their back door. Uh, they would take me off camping uh, with their son John. And this was made thinking about Ansel Adams uh, in the Borrego Desert. And I just, I made this photograph and I thought, oh, this is awesome, I've got to show it to Ansel. And when I returned to uh, Santa Cruz, I called, made an appointment, planned to come down to see him and show him this photograph. And of course, I'd never met him before, but I thought, well, you know, he's just in Carmel. I can get the gas together to, it's all downhill from Santa Cruz to Carmel. <laughs> I did stop on the way to see Wynne Bullock, who I had informally studied with, and I showed him the picture and he thought it was hilarious and he loved it. But he also was working in the dark room and I looked at some things. I was an hour late by the time that I got down to Ansel's. 
Virginia opened the door and she just said, you're an hour late. And I thought, oh, I'm dead. Uh, but she invited me in and sat down. There was this beautiful room off to the right of the doorway with flat files and giant photographs. There was a, a huge photograph, probably this size of uh, Half Dome, and underneath was a pumpkin with Ansel's hat on it. And it just looked hilarious. I mean, it looked just like him. And I thought, well, it, maybe it won't be so bad. He came out, he was incredibly gracious, generous. He didn't mention how late I was. Um, he was just excellent in every possible way. Uh, he did, when I did finally show, he, I was carrying a giant portfolio, and he says, well, let's see your pictures. And I pulled this one out, and he moved his hands around it, and he talked about what kind of developer I was using because the, the whites in my clouds were blocking up. And, and he kind of moved his hand around it a bit, and he finally settled over Bob and Ellie, blocking them out. <laughs> and he said, you know, if you just didn't have these people in here, this might be a pretty good picture. Anyway, Wynn was, Wynn was wonderful. I really enjoyed sharing moments with him. The funny thing is that we'll go places. We'll go to Multnomah Falls. And for me, I love the falls. I love the, all the nature. and all. I'm looking for a person to put in front of the falls. This is one of the sacred sites in Western photography, uh, Point Lobos. It's called The Slot. Edward Weston made a photograph there, Ansel Adams. Uh, Wynn uh, did a beautiful photograph there. And I thought, I've got to do something. You know, I've got to document this place. I am in this sacred space. And two nuns happened to be walking by. And I thought, oh, this was perfect. And, and of course, they were very uh, kind to sit for me while I made a photograph. Uh, it's also great to work in collaboration with photographers. We have such a rich history. One of the things that I love is looking back through history and photographers who have documented the world in their own special way. Uh, Irving Penn, in his small trades photograph, um, and the photographer particularly, has always been one of my favorite photographs. So Stu Levy, Dr. Stu Levy, uh, suggested we restage this photograph, uh, although he is not smoking what would be called an actual cigar. Uh, after July 1st, it was something else. Uh, Bob and Ellie took me to the mountains of Baja, and we traveled around uh, horseback for two weeks, and it was like going back in time. It was, this was 1975. Um, it was great that I was able to speak Spanish, and I was taken kind of into the personal life of the people that we were with that lived in that area. Um, this is actually uh, El Chino and his grandson. I, did, I carried an SX-70 at the time, and I did photographs of the people. And I'd just done a photograph of the little boy, and he's holding the photograph that I made of him with the SX-70. Uh, I did have some photographs in a cafe. I've shown in cafes. This is the one image that was thrown out of a show. Uh, they were eating hamburgers, and they just the owner said, no, nah, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, John, my best friend, was with me on the trip, and um, his behavior was to read Madame Bovary, which I suppose in the mountains of Baja does resonate. Uh, Bob and Ellie, the guides. I came back to San Diego and I was really interested in being a street photographer. Um, this image I love because it's two eggs, bacon, uh, sausage, hotcakes for a dollar fifty. That's their special. Being able to document the world um, following in behind tour groups as they went through the gas lamp district in San Diego and just kind of becoming invisible and making photographs as people pass through. Um, walking through the park and kind of just seeing something happen. But there were always family and friends when I got bored and this is uh, our family doctor, Dr. John. Um, so they'd put up with me and my camera. Uh, it was also the time for great concerts. Um, I didn't go see Jimi Hendrix because I think it was like $5 for tickets or Joan Baez. I did go see Fleetwood Mac, and this was an open-air concert with Fleetwood Mac, I think The Dead, Country Joe, uh, Lee Michaels. It was a whole group of people, and for $5 it seemed worthwhile to, to get a, a photograph or to go and, and make photographs. There is, the subject of this photograph is a photographer. Who sees him? No. Uh, so right here. Oh, there you go. I 
would love to see this program. I mean, the other thing that I think about this is when I've, I've brought it up to 16 by 20, and looking at the people, one of the first times, I realized that there's no logos. In 1975, there were no logos on t-shirts. I found one up in the very corner up there, but you won't be tested on that later, so don't worry about it. It's, uh, somebody had written something like, I love you, Linda, on his shirt. This is a photograph that I, I don't publish or post online. I, I do have an Instagram and Facebook and Flickr. Um, I was working in the darkroom. I had use of a darkroom and late at night was processing film and I heard a, an announcement on the radio that there'd be a Nazi rally in Balboa Park on Sunday, for a matter of fact. And I thought, really? You know, 75 San Diego, it was conservative. But I called the radio station I said, you know, did you just announce there'd be a Nazi rally in the park on Sunday? And I could hear him shuffling papers and he said, yes, Nazi rally, band shell, two o'clock. So I had to go. And I was packing up my coat. I was still staying with my grandparents. My grandmother burst into tears when I naively, she said, where are you going? And I said, well, there's a Nazi rally. And <laughs> she's like, ah. I had just bought an F1 from a sailor who came back from Japan. It was very common for sailors to go to Japan, buy a camera at the exchange, come back, sell it, and make a little bit of money. So I had a Canon F1 with a 24 millimeter lens. Didn't realize how close I would be to the people I was photographing until I started making the photographs. And then had to change rolls of film and sat down in a, one of the benches open in the front. And this man turned to me as I was reloading and he said, do you know that woman over there? And, and I looked and there's a woman taking pictures. I said, no. And he said, I said, well, why? And he said, she was taking pictures of you, taking pictures of them. And I think she thought you were about to get beat up. I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder who comes to a Nazi rally in San Diego. And I turned around and sitting behind me on the bench was a man with really long blonde hair, beautiful woman, a uh, little girl next to him, smoking a little stubby cigar. Uh, and he had this big belt buckle that said Hell's Angels. And I thought, are you really a Hell's Angel? And he said, well, yeah, I am. And I, of course, I had to do some photographs. A week later, when I went to, I got his phone number, uh, arranged to take pictures to him, I was told he's in the hospital. He'd been hit by a junk, drunk driver. When I got there, there were a number of angels all around the room. Uh, one guy leaned over to shake my hand, and there was kind of like a line of grease on the wall where he'd been leaning. Um, you might notice Dexter is smoke, has his cigar uh, in, the, in, his, in his bed there. And over a period of almost two years, I would go out and visit them. Um, you can see I was heavily into Richard Avedon. Uh, they had a white wall on a garage, and I posed them there. Uh, this is Snake, Dexter, and Crazy Charlie. Um, I was told, someone asked me about showing the photographs, and I, I really am a little bit reluctant to post them. I do post this one online but I don't post the rest of the series. I have like three rolls of Nazis that'll never be published. I have a lot of photographs of the Hells Angels. Maybe sometime they will be. Uh, I was told Snake was killed in a shootout in Texas years ago and other things since 1975. Their life expectancy is not that long. They had a badge that said over 45. And uh, so 45 years later, I, I don't know. Um, Schultz in the middle became president and he was a high school classmate of mine, but he was always in the auto shop, so I never really had too much to do with him. I uh, did a lot of details, a lot of their interactions, and uh, along the El Camino Real. I had a little Honda 350, which was not part of the club's identity at the time. <laughs> and. They kept telling me, you know, we're, we're going to get you a real motorcycle. And, but meanwhile, they put me on the back. Um, I can see in the mirror on this one that it's somebody from Burdu. So they put me on the back of a motorcycle of somebody in the club uh, to go to different events. Crunch, who was the president at the time, had a skull collection that he was very proud of. And after we did this photograph, he asked me upstairs and he said, oh, let's, let's come on upstairs and I'll, I'll have my girlfriend, my lady, give you a sandwich or something. And so I went upstairs and had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with a wall of skulls that I did not ask about. Uh, 
Uh, within the week, I was called and told, you've got to come to a funeral. Crunch's girlfriend committed suicide with his uh, 45. She would have been 21. And then a week later, uh, I was called that Chato also had been killed. Um, that's actually a 16 by 20 that I made for the funeral and for them. Uh, one of the pictures of him up against the wall. And there's also a group photograph in the coffin uh, with him. He and his wife had gone to a party and evidently had a dispute at the party. Uh, he rode the motorcycle home and she drove the truck home accidentally running over him. Don't argue with your wife. I have shown this series a couple of times in this format, just a, a few images. In the 80s, I became a dad. Uh, my daughter was born in 1982. I had a friend from college that said, how can you have kids and be an artist? And my thought was, you know, the kids are going to really enrich my experience. I was interested in people. So that's my son, who was born in 87, uh, in San Francisco, loved being in San Francisco, documenting uh, parades and street events. And what I would do is I would stake this corner where I could have the kids behind the barrier. I could hold on to them. They wouldn't get swept away as the protests or events or people walked by. And I was still able to make photographs and be right in the middle of the crowds. This is, uh, I guess, the first Bush uh, bombing. At the time, I was working in the late 80s at Butterfield and Butterfield. I did uh, photography for their auction catalogs. And the cool thing was, the first day I got there, they handed me a stack of prints. And they said, here, go copy these. And the very first one was an Ansel Adams portrait of Edward Weston, uh, huge. And I was able to actually look at the photographs of people I admired, see their notes on the back, you know, not for reproduction, do not copy. Do not but also their handwritten notes about the images. Um, and it was like all the treasures of the world came through Butterfield and Butterfield at that time. I also loved Asian art, and so had an opportunity to do uh, most of the Asian collections and auctions. My daughter always wanted a puppy. She said, oh, I want a puppy, I want a puppy. I took her to work one day. I was doing the Chinese sculpture, and I said, there's your dog. I did photographs, actually she's wearing an Art Against AIDS t-shirt. In the early 80s, I became active with um, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation and uh, would attend pride parades. And this is a photograph that actually appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle of me doing photographs of uh, the AIDS walk. My caution is always have a nice expression on your face. And my son was like, well, usually people are not going to be taking pictures of us. It's just you're doing something goofy. But he was able to meet interesting people. <laughs> Generally, this is the way that I worked. And someone's asked me, how is it that I'm able to approach people in the street and do photographs? I think maybe I'm entertaining uh, in some way. Uh, and initially, the carryover was that carrying a four-year-old boy on your shoulders and having your daughter hanging onto your belt loop put people at ease. Uh, Pride Parade. Early 90s, I loved uh, Fuji Riala. So these are photographs made with Fuji Riala. These prints were blown up to 30 by 30 at Udevelop on Barber. I would come up and use their darkroom um, and still have some of those prints if anybody's interested. Uh, Carnival. Uh, St. Stupid's Parade, I've, I've enjoyed doing photographs of people kissing in the streets. And I also try to put something like a monument in the background. This is Coit Tower, kind of like Hiroshige's views of Mount Fuji, but uh, Americanized. And again, romance in San Francisco. This photograph, when I printed it at Udevelop in 30 by 40, it first came out with the motorcycle. And there was a whole group of men gathered around the machine waiting for the prints to come out. And as it came out, the motorcycle started appearing and they kind of went, oh, motorcycle, ah, oh, cool. <laughs> and, then, and then the woman without <clears throat> most of her underwear, and they're like, oh, and it really got their attention, and the flowers. And then all of a sudden when they saw it was two women kissing, it got really quiet. 
Uh, my kids could tell when I was on a mission to make a photograph. Uh, they put up with me for a lot, so the reward was I'd take them to Pier 39 one day. They weren't allowed to use video games at home. Um, we didn't, you know, unfortunately, well, ice cream, I have an addiction to ice cream and cookies. Vicky indulges. Um, so we went to Pier 39 one afternoon, and I was going to treat them to whack-a-mole and churros and ice cream and video games. The twins were walking down the Embarcadero, and my daughter could see as I turned to look, she said, no, don't stop, don't stop. <laughs> but uh, they were really generous. They gave me two rolls. I, I shot two rolls of film. Uh, they posed as, as, as I asked. Um, I had a lot of people look at this photograph comparing their toes and their teeth, thinking that maybe it was Photoshopped. But again, this was 1990, so it was before Photoshop or before I had any ability to do Photoshop. Um, when I found them to give them a print, they lived in an apartment up on Knob Hill. They were both dressed like Dale Evans. Little cowgirl vests and toy holsters and uh, the, anyway, cowgirl hat. It was, um, again, homeless people. I'm part of, I, I participate in a $2 portrait um, informal group on Flickr where you give someone $2 for putting up with making a photograph. Uh, I definitely give it to women uh, that I photograph in the streets, and uh, this is a woman that a magazine wanted to use in December. Uh, I'm partial to artists and creative people. This is Chen Yi, who is a composer, um, came from China to America. Uh, she's amazing, and her husband, Joe Long, won the Pulitzer Prize last year before last, I think, for his opera. Uh, and that photograph was used in a couple of things. Beatrice Wood, the mama of Dada. Uh, she was the inspiration for um, Jules and Jim, the woman who was involved with the artists, uh, Marcel Duchamp, Max Ernst. She was living in Ojai, and I thought, you know, I really admire her. On the 4th of July, I drove down to Ojai. Uh, I had a couple of days. I'd arranged to stay with a friend in Los Angeles, just knocking on her door, thinking, well, you know, we'll see. And she answered herself. I said, I'm an admirer. I'd love to do portraits and in an interview. Uh, I've got a place to stay in LA for a couple of days when you have time. She says, you're here. Come on in. Let's, let's just do it. She gave me like a couple of hours. We, she changed clothes, threw pots, and then that image was used uh, by the Museum of California for a show for her. This was 1985, and at one point she got really excited. She says, I have to show you something new. And at that time, computers filled the size of a shipping container. We turned the corner, there was a little alcove, and she had a little Macintosh, one of the early first Macintosh computers sitting on a desk. And she says, watch this. And she opened it up and scrolled and pulled the things and did all this stuff. And I, I was like stunned, and I said, Beto, I mean, I, I don't mean to be rude, but you're 90 years old and a potter. What are you doing with a computer? And she goes, I'm writing my autobiography. And she did. Uh, it was called I Shocked Myself um, and was, you know, really, really great. I went back when she was 100 uh, with Ben and uh, for an update and also just to have a chance to meet with her again. But she was a wonderful person. Lou Harrison, a uh, modern composer, lived in Aptos. Uh, his partner um, built the gamelan that he's using. Uh, that was used for a couple of, couple of things. Lucy Rhee um, had escaped from uh, Austria during World War II and came to London, uh, a potter. She couldn't make a living as a potter in London during World War II because her work was too industrial and uh, basically too European. Bernard Leach and Shoji Hamada had pretty much uh, controlled folk pottery and it was their style that was the most popular. Um, after the war, Bernard Leach uh, endorsed her work and then she was able to sell her ceramics. When we met, she fixed me coffee and really wonderful, if you've been, well, strong black coffee and it was in a pot that Bernard Leach had made and given to her. I met Mary Holmes in 73 when I was a, a student at the university and she painted, she was, in, she was an art historian, uh, taught uh, 
into myths and bringing myths into uh, art. And the kids loved to go visit her at her studio. She lived on the top of a mountain and it was a windy road with unicorns and horses and toys and things at every turn. And she had horses and dogs and cats and Japanese furry chickens and all kinds of things. I called her, um, maybe learning to warn people before I showed up, and said, you know, what are you working on? I'm thinking of bringing the kids down. She said, oh, it's great. I'm working on a painting about love. And I thought, well, okay, so I'll, we'll come down and we'll, we'll see this painting about love. And as we came into her barn with a six-foot canvas, she had just done the underpainting in a red iron oxide, and she'd you know, basically drawn the basic figures. We came and we were confronted with a full nude woman in red iron oxide that looked like dried blood holding the head of a, a man that was dripping blood, and she had a sword, <laughs> and there was this body at the bottom. I said, Mary, uh, I thought you said this was a painting about love. And she said, well, sometimes things just don't work out. <laughs> I took my kids to England and Wales to see uh, where their grandmother came from. And uh, that was July of 99. And in August, we went to Burning Man. And I thought, you know, Stonehenge, Burning Man, you know, kind of makes sense. Uh, so we did have the Welsh flag above the tent. Uh, my daughter was 18, my son was 12, and I figured I'd better get him to Burning Man when he's 12, and then we can sort of work into uh, puberty and everything else. Um, I usually don't dress up much, uh, but it seemed appropriate to dress a little bit. I did use my Hasselblad in the, in the, uh, on the playa, which caused a lot of trouble when I got back after a few years and had somebody try to clean it. But I wanted to do portraits. Uh, I did a lot of photographs for the art, uh, the artery and Lady B uh, of the art installations, but I was mostly interested in portraits. Again, doing what I was doing in the streets of San Francisco uh, with a quality camera and beautiful Fuji film. I call this uh, nuclear family. Uh, Larry Harvey. Uh, who started Burning Man. And again, I was thinking about the man in the background and creating something with the man in the background uh, of some of the images. Uh, this is the temple uh, that's just, you know, fantastic, uh, all made out of scrap plywood. Uh, this picture actually appeared in a German business magazine. Uh, they contacted me, and, and I had a friend who read German read it to me, and it was basically, okay, German businessmen in your August vacation, this is the place you should go. <laughs> in 2004, I met this really beautiful girl, and uh, we met in January, uh, went to a couple of things in February, I proposed in March, and in June we were married in Indiana. Um, she was a librarian in a previous lifetime, and so after we got married in June in Indiana, I thought, well, I have to take her to Burning Man. So, um, and what would a librarian do at Burning Man but find the lending library? I occasionally try to set up photographs, and this was a case where I saw this couple and I thought, I want to do a takeoff on Grant Wood's farmer, uh, holding the pitchfork, American Gothic, uh, very straight but this really attractive couple. Um, I made one of the first primary errors in not checking how much film I had um, before I asked them to do the photograph. I had to reload, and I said, excuse me, just entertain yourselves for a minute. I'm, I'm gonna reload film, I'll be, I'll be right there. And clearly they did. Um, and I was able to make a photograph that I hadn't planned. One of the things that I, I really love about making photographs is not being able to completely anticipate uh, where you're going with images, and then also the collaboration between people who can change your concept into something else. Although in Indiana, uh, most of the people thought it was very strange for a man to be walking down the street with a ladder. Um, Vicky had a yarn shop, and somebody came in once, and they said, you know, on the way here, 
I saw this guy standing on a ladder in the middle of the street taking pictures. And another woman said, oh, that's just Jim. That's her husband. Don't worry about it. But uh, I generally amused people. When we left California, we had to explain to the utilities, the phone. I got kind of tiresome telling them, you're moving from San Francisco to Indiana? And eventually I said, well, as a joke, I said, well, I'm going to meet Indians. And ironically, I did. Uh, Hobby Lobby in the Midwest, I was told they carry a lot of supplies you wouldn't find out on the West Coast. Um, but I enjoyed the farms, the gardeners, uh, again, people in the streets. This photograph almost got me injured. Uh, I picked up Vicki at the yarn store and she was ready for a hamburger at Little Sheba's, which is just past these American flags. And I saw the photograph and again, like my kids, she could tell I was going to stop and make a photograph when she wanted to have lunch. Um, anyway, I, we all survived. Um, her father had a toy uh, that was a spelling toy. Um, it's interesting going through my uncle's images and seeing an image from 1943 that really speaks to the kind of work that I eventually did. This is uh, a young boy in China, 1943. And in Indiana, I found an image of a boy that kind of echoed. Uh, there was a memorial service in, at Earlham Cemetery, and there was a man who was a Vietnam veteran who channeled Abraham Lincoln. He was just amazing. And I thought, this would be a great photograph. I'll get a picture of Abe Lincoln in front of these flags. But there was a guy with a t-shirt talking to somebody else in the background. And I, I said, could you guys move for a minute so I can do a picture? Um, and the guy with the t-shirt moved, but the other guy didn't. And he sort of stood there, planted himself at you know, parade rest. And I thought, well, OK, I'll just take the picture, and then I'll do another one without him. I was on exposure number 12. Uh, when I said to Lonnie, I said, you know, can you wait just a minute? I, I'll reload. He goes, no, I'm, there's a Vietnam ceremony at the top of the hill. I've, I've got to go. And he was gone. And again, I was left alone with one exposure, hoping uh, that it worked out. And to tell you the truth, I'm much happier with this one than just with the president and the flags. Um, but Lonnie and I did a number of things. We went to Indianapolis. I would take him places and, and scare people. Uh, they would be stunned. He was the President Lincoln that people would want President Lincoln to be. He had a really deep voice. He was really kind. Uh, we would go to street festivals. <coughs> And I saw Bo coming up the street, and I said, oh, Bo, have you met President Lincoln? And so they shook hands, and I took a picture, and then um, proceeded to reload film. While I'm standing there reloading, I could hear over the back of my shoulder somebody say, film? Are you using film? Is that a camera and film that you're using? And I turned, and I looked, and he had a table, and he, it was full of books, and I said, are those books? <laughs> Are you selling books? I can't remember the last time I saw somebody reading a book. And he said, oh, shut up. <laughs> I also met Harry Lovell, who was a Tuskegee Airman. And Vicki would know every time I went to visit Harry because I'd come home and I, I couldn't wait to tell her, you know, what threat Jack was under and that Nick and Sharon had had another fight and Adam had taken the baby and the hospital was under siege. There was a fire. Anyway. She knew that I'd been to see Harry because he was addicted to Young and the Restless. <laughs> he was invited as a Tuskegee Airman by who he called my senator, Dianne Feinstein, to the 2008 inauguration of President Obama. And I was honored uh, to be his escort um, with a few other people who showed up. Uh, I had planned to take Lonnie. Uh, Lonnie and I had plans to go to Gettysburg and also I thought, how cool would this be? Abraham Lincoln in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, I think Agent Orange ate him up from within. He died about six months after I met him. I almost emigrated to Portland in 1990. Uh, and this is a photograph that you might recognize, the Japanese garden. Again, I love people because of the unanticipated rewards of thinking you're going to make a photograph that looks one way, and then finding out that 
they, particularly kids, have another idea. So this is David and June and, and their daughter Charlotte. Uh, Joanna Priestley, um, who is an amazing filmmaker. Coming back to Portland a couple of years ago, I now am wandering the streets with my camera, uh, annoying people uh, who will put up with me, uh, who give me their own The Portland Art Museum has also been uh, something of an inspiration. Uh, I've loved to come here and see the shows. Um, they had the Robert Adams show, too, which I thought, thought was very inspiring, and, and clearly this couple was inspired as well by the photographs. This is kind of what I look like now. This is photographed by uh, Nick Burdett, who is um, an amazing photographer at Blue Moon Camera. Um, my favorite camera has become the Crown Graphic. Uh, and I love to do photographs of people in the streets with it. And again, it's going back to my roots of channeling uh, the people that I admire, Dorothea Lange, Margaret Burke White, um, Lewis Hine, and the size of the image. But one of the things that I hadn't anticipated is that I've become kind of an entertainment as well. Uh, Vicky got this photograph of this whole busload of Japanese tourists watching and filming me as I was making the photograph. But I think having the size of the camera and the detail and the depth, uh, it works for me on one level, it works on a performance level, but it also works on the people who are willing to sit still for me for a period of time. Uh, Burnside Skate Park, I'd heard, is one of the cool places in town, and of course I had to go down there, and after we got kicked out once, went back without Vicky because I didn't want uh, to run the risk of anything untoward happening two times in a row. When I got there, this man said, you're not taking any pictures. And I said, that's okay. I just, I used to roll, I have a skateboard. My wife won't let me use it anymore, but I, I admire the park and I just wanted to see it. We started talking and chatting and at a certain point, I carry my camera in a backpack. I pulled the graphic out of the backpack and unfolded it and he said, dude, is that your camera? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. And he goes, that rips. That's a good thing, like he had to explain it to me. And I said, well, do you want to do a photograph? And he goes, yeah. So I got his email address, we're best friends. Uh, again, I don't know if it's the process, I don't really think it's completely me, but I think it's the camera and I think it's the participation. And it's really enjoyable uh, to use that kind of a camera and get the detail in the streets of people, no matter when they show up or what kind of Things. I also feel it's a little bit larger, so I have something between me and... Uh... <laughs> and I get to hear some really good stories. It takes me a little while, a little bit longer to set up, uh, but I get to hear some really good stories from the people. The other thing I find is that it's always the last photograph you make that's the best one. Um, which may take a few minutes, and as I fumble I, or pretend to fumble with the camera, uh, it puts the person at ease and I can get some really nice photographs. Or photographs that I'm happy with. And there's no shortage of characters or backgrounds in Portland. And even uh, someone who's very reluctant to have their photograph made uh, will sit still for you. Uh, I saw this woman and I saw her with this backpack and I thought, this is really cool. She's got this giant backpack, she's slim, I'd, I'd love to do a photograph. And I talked to her and she said, yeah, sure, okay. But she put her backpack down and she started digging in her pack and I, I thought, well, you know, that's not really what I wanted. I wanted her wearing the backpack. And I said, you know, and then I could see she was pulling out a, an ax and I said, well, I kind of, can I just do it? And she turned to me and she says, I really need the cigarette. I'm like, okay, okay, she's holding an ax. Uh, but I wanted her to look at me, and I thought, uh, anyway, I had this idea of what I wanted. Uh, I think I may have been a little bit anxious and nervous because I wanted her to face me. I did a double exposure accidentally where she's lighting her cigarette and she's turning to face me holding the ax. And I'm thinking if I had made the photograph that I thought I wanted or that I knew that I wanted or at the moment that I wanted it, you know, it may not have been as good as, as, as this one. And I really enjoy this one. Um, 
film, 4x5 film. I actually had the pleasure of working on a local feature movie that will be out soon. If you haven't seen the previews, it's on Facebook. Neil Stryker and the Tyrant of Time. Locally produced, it's hilarious. Uh, and I did some 4x5 production stills for him. Um, and that was really a, an amazing, wonderful experience. The other aspect of life that I find really rewarding is having started at nine years old, finding a customer come into the store who's nine years old and seeing the images that he makes. For a lot of kids, particularly young girls uh, and boys, they're told what to do. They're told when to show up, when to go to bed, what to wear, what to, what to you know, everything, what to eat. If you have a camera with film, you can decide when to push the button. You can tell your parents how to pose or how to stand or how to look. It's the first aspect of control that children have over the world. And I think it's really rewarding. Um, they can decide whether to process the film or not. They don't have to show the image. And it's been really rewarding having a few young customers that are determined to make beautiful photographs. And seeing Adrian's first print of the St. John's Bridge that he made through the window of his father's car as they're driving across, and the print that he actually made and thinking that he's nine, which is when I started, imagine a few years in the future, uh, what kind of adventures will he have? Hopefully he'll end up in St. John's in Portland and find a beautiful woman to spend uh, his time with and a, a boss who puts up with him and a community of creative photographers uh, to share the work with. Thank you. <laughs>